Our next guest for me requires no introduction, <laughs> but he is for me one of the most spectacular people on the planet. We were introduced 20 some years ago by a mutual connection who said, you guys must know each other. At the time, we were both very deeply embedded in the corporate structures and the importance of professional image in the corporate environment. Mm -hmm. And Herb and I created a program called She Said, He Said, and we took it on the road and we started talking about the male and female perspectives of professional image in the workplace. It was, I think, the most fun I've ever had in that business environment. And I'm so grateful to call Herb Knoll my friend and be able to introduce him to you. We've had a lot of life lived between then and now. And Herb is up to some amazing things, most prominently his widower's support network. And we're going to talk about how he got from banking to his widower support network. Herb Knoll, thank you for being on the show. We're so happy to have you. Thank you. And thank you, Amy, uh, very, very much. So Herb, it's been a while. Uh, and I know we're going to talk about the Widower Support Network. However, I'd like you to bring us kind of up to speed to how you got to there. Okay. Well, uh, in 2004, my wife was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Um, and she was able to have the surgery that was recommended. And she lived for 39 months uh, after that. Uh, I unfortunately had the privilege of watching her go from a size 8 to a 6, to a 4, to a 2, to a 0. And when she finally died in March of 2008, I became a widower at the age of 57. Like most men, I thought I could cope. And like most men, I wasn't doing that well. So one day, a young lady on my staff, where I worked at a bank, walked into my office and said, uh, we missed your laughter on the floor. And it was then that I knew that I needed some help. So I went to my church. I went to the Veterans Administration. And I went to Barnes & Noble. And at Barnes & Noble, I asked a gentleman, what do you have for a new widower? And he looked on his search engine, then he looked up at me and said, Mr. I don't have a thing to so we went over to the bookcase and there were 15 books there. Every one of them was designed to be read by a widow. Mm. Not a widow. And therein lies the problem mm. that men don't give people time to have help when they're grieving. Even when I returned to work, my human resource officer walked into my office and saw me crying. He turned around and walked right back out. Now, if I was a girl, I would say he would probably would have handed me a tissue or a glass of water or said, are you okay, dear? But I'm a man, and people don't know how to treat that. So I, um, I decided that someone needed to write a book, and that person might as well be me, because I've written them before. And I took on the challenge of creating a book like none other called The Widower's Journey. I quit my job of 38 year career and I spent eight years researching the world of widowers. I almost quit at least a dozen times, but I was inspired by, you know, when I was in church one day and I said to God, if you need this book, you've got to send me a sign because I'm ready to walk. I was so frustrated and ready to and the pastor got up and did a homily that was perfect for my years. So I said, okay, God, you're going to get your book. And six months later, the, the book was published. Um, since then, it's taken on a life of its own. And I literally work seven days a week for the betterment of widowers. Now, widowers, one in five men will be widowed. There are 3.25 million widowers in America. And yet most people, if you were to ask them if they know a widower, 
they would say no. Then five minutes would go by. And then they would look up at you and they would, they would say, oh, wait a minute, the neighbor down the street or the, the guy at work or the person at church or whatever, then it's a distant thought. It's not top of mind. Where if you ask people, you know a widow? Oh, yeah. You know, most people can name a widow or two. So anyhow, it's men, it's a combination of society doesn't know what to do with us. And yet, we don't make it easy for them because we have big egos and we don't like to ask for help. And so we always tell people, well, I'm fine. Leave me alone with my thoughts. So um, I decided that these men needed some sage advice, some man to man talk. And I didn't, I didn't hold back uh, in my book or in anything else that I've done. And lo and behold, I've got an enterprise here where I'm supporting 1,400 plus men, widowed men from 36 countries daily. Um, and, I, and I have two Facebook pages, one for the general public and one for just men where they can go in and talk privately. And they do, and they open up. And there are of all ages, all circumstances, um, and they have a lot of problems, a lot of problems, because a man can run a corporation, but it doesn't mean he can pay the paper boy on time or do the grocery shopping and not forget certain items. Men have an attitude that, that they live their life as fixers. And when something's broken, they fix it. Well, when they're widowed, they see themselves as broken. So they walk, they start applying fixes and they do so without giving in much thought to it. Or they say, well, I know that men aren't good at this, but I'm different. Oh, are you really? <laughs> Not really. And <laughs> uh, men propose to the first woman they meet, they, they divorce them two weeks later, they move across the country. There's a Lots of horror stories, not all men, but too many men. So anyhow, I, we provide them the advice that they need and the community that they need. And it's not just me. I have volunteers all over the place. And the men are uh, supported in ways that I never even would, could have imagined uh, that we do it today. So that's where I got my little start. And now I have a podcast. Which is fabulous, actually. And I've listened to a number of episodes and the stories, you're crying and laughing at the same time. You just don't know which way to go first. Yeah. And so basically your book and your effort to heal yourself has turned into an opportunity to really heal so many others and, and help guide them. So it's a ministry on top of a book and a podcast and a community, you've really created a ministry. Mm -hmm. Right. And we have all types of people. We have PhDs and Nobel laureates, and we have unemployed truck drivers. We have men who are widowed from suicide. I had a new member today whose wife was suicide. suicide. Uh, we've had all the different diseases. We have men who are in their 90s, men that are in their 20s. And they, they have one common thread. They're widowed. And they will take advice from each other. And it's marvelous to see and watch this. They will take advice from a 20-year-old coaching a 90-year-old. I mean, and they never even inquire whether or not the person is of the same age. Mm. They even form sub-communities. Like in Denver, they went to a baseball game together. All the members who lived around Denver. In Plano, Texas, near Dallas, they have they meet for breakfast every couple of weeks. I mean, uh, by the way, I looked it up. I have 133 members from California. So I probably have some of your residents uh, watching this show as my members. Um, yeah, it's it's the best thing I've ever done, Laura. It's, 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 
it's changed my life, I will tell you, doing this kind of work. It certainly was therapeutic mm-hmm. for me uh, to get over my grief. And, I, and I'm remarried, and I'm very happily married, And but there was a time for me when I needed that. Mm-hmm. And this, this investment of time uh, did it for me. <clears throat> and let's say it's, I, I tease about it that my golf game was going nowhere, so I decided to do this. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> oh, that's too funny. That's really true because I gave up golf because I don't have time to play golf now. That's But the friends that I've made through this endeavor has been wonderful. And the charity, the, the seeing these people be willing to help another man, it's therapeutic for them as well. Um, I, I, I love it. I mean, I... I admire the men. Uh, it's an investment. I don't make any money. I, it costs me money to do this, but it's it's what I do, um, and I hope to get better at it. Mm. Well, I, it sounds like it sounds like you're supporting and helping so many. So beyond self reliance, and as we have to move into um, the next segment, we'd love to have you back on because I feel like we're just scratching the surface. If you're willing, but what's a, what's a final takeaway that you could give us, and to all of our viewers who are watching who may be widowers, what would you tell them to do as a first step? Don't hold back. Hmm. Widowers decline help. And they need to accept help. And what the widowers frequently um, fall short on is um, they think that they're the only one that's free. Mm -hmm. And the focus is on their happiness. Mm -hmm. And they, they overlook their own children. They overlook the family members, the neighbors. Uh, the co-workers of their deceased wife, uh, they, they're very selfish mm-hmm. because something's missing in their life. And they're, they, again, they see themselves as broken. They want to fix it. Yeah. Uh, I encourage the men to accept the help of others because the other people who are reaching out to him, a lot of times they will, they will hold back. But when they do reach out, it may be because of a promise that they made to his deceased wife to look after Bill after I'm gone. And so this man or woman is trying to fulfill their grief uh, obligation to the deceased by helping the husband. So don't be so difficult to accept help. Mm. Uh, it's, It's good for everybody concerned. And also when you start dating, don't compare. Don't compare. It's it's unfair, and unless you're willing to be compared to whoever she's had in her life before. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I was with one man, and he told me he had a date, and I said great. And, and then he said, well, I did meet her once already, and she's not like my wife. And I said, good. I said that's that's great. I said you don't want her to be like your wife. She's going to feel different in your arms. She's going to kiss different. She's going to smile different. Everything about her is going to be different. She's going to laugh different. She's going to like Mexican food instead of Chinese food. I mean, you want that difference. Mm-hmm. Uh, and don't hold her to the standard of your wife. That's, mm-hmm. that's a huge mistake, and you'll never be happy. Mm-hmm. Excellent advice. So, Herb, we know um, you have made a very generous offer of 15% off your book to any of our viewers who would like to have the book. And that also will come with five articles that you've written. The Widower's Journey. Perfect. Uh, The Widower's Journey. And it features Dr. Deborah Carr from Boston University uh, and Bob Sprick, um, who's an economist. And there's that book is available at Amazon.com, where it earns four and a half out of five stars for $14.95. And I'm going to just down to 15%. And then also I'm going to toss in 
five articles, and I'll just read off the titles for you. Uh, grief recovery programs need to include action plans. Do widowers make good husbands? Men need to have purpose. And I can't tell you how many times I hear that. That's, that's a problem for men. Mm -hmm. The dangers of compound isolation, which we're all experiencing now. And this one I'm especially proud of, the whole trilogy, compelling stories of three men who came out of a very difficult time in their life and prospered. And uh, mm -hmm. I'll email you to your viewers. What, what is your email address? It's herb at widowerssupportnetwork.com. Perfect. We'll put that on the screen as well. And okay. I hope everyone will reach out to you. And I ditto Amy's comment. We need to have you back. We could do a whole show with, with the work that you've done. And I hope we will. So well, thank very, you so much for joining us. I'm so pleased to see you again, Laura. <laughs> Amy, nice to make your acquaintance. It's so nice I, to I meet am, you. I am a huge Osmond Family fan. Oh, I love it. <laughs> I had a crush on Marie going way back. I love it. Well, thank you so, so you much. You must have been the only one. <laughs>